History is filled with great mysteries that have captured our imagination. What happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Is there a city of Atlantis? What is Area 51? (laughs) But April 21st, 1986 became a day that will always be remembered in the annals of mystery history. On that day, one of the most life-compelling and drama-inducing mysteries of all time was solved once and for all. If you are alive and old enough to remember, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was the opening of Al Capone's vault. For two hours that will never be gained back, 30 million Americans huddled around their TVs with rapt attention to witness nothing. Absolutely nothing happened for two hours. If you're ever given the choice to watch the opening of Al Capone's vault or to watch a documentary on the Helvetica font, I would recommend the documentary. There really is a documentary on the Helvetica font. Meet the cast, now see the movie. It is a documentary film by Gary Hustwit. And all I can say is thank you, Mr. Hustwit, for your contribution to humanity. At least it wasn't the opening of Al Capone's vault. Now, Believe it or not, there is a mystery that deserves our attention. It is the greatest mystery of all time. It is the mystery of all mysteries, the creme de la creme of mysteries. And today, I, David Rhodes, am going to give you the solution to this mystery. Now, undoubtedly, you're saying to yourself, self How fortunate a person I must be to sit under the tutelage of the person who has discovered the solution to the greatest mystery of all time. I wonder how this man in the South Plains of West Texas in the year of our Lord 2022 came upon this knowledge. Well, wonder no more. I will reveal to you my skills of deduction. Are you ready? I read my Bible. Now, I have a confession to make. I was not the first person to discover the solution to this mystery. In fact, when I finally reveal the solution to this mystery to you, undoubtedly you will say, I already knew that. But what you might not know is why it was a mystery in the first place. And so let's discover what this mystery is all about. If you have access to a Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 24, we'll read through verse 29. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. We're in a series walking verse by verse through the book of Colossians. And the series is called Christ Overflowing. And so when you found Colossians chapter 1 verse 24, I would invite you to stand with me please in honor of the reading of God's Word. Paul the Apostle writes... To the church at Colossae, these words in verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. I have become its servant, according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim Him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with His strength that works powerfully in me. Father, I pray that you would Grant us insight and knowledge into this mystery and into the revelation of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So here's the situation. Paul, about 2,000 years ago, not quite, but pretty close, is uh, writing a letter to the church in Colossae. Colossae is a town in modern-day Turkey. And this is a church that he did not start. This is a church who uh, probably most members he did not know, and yet... 
In verse 24, Paul says to them, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. What's Paul talking about? Well, basically this. Jesus Christ had commissioned Paul to take the good news of Jesus to non-Jewish people. That's what the Bible calls Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And this was to be the thrust of his life, the vocation of his life. This was the driving purpose of his life. It is what compelled Paul each and every day and each and every waking moment. And so Paul gave himself for this purpose of taking the good news of Jesus to the Gentiles. He spent himself for this purpose. He was willing to be imprisoned for this purpose. In fact, he was at the time. He was willing to be abused for this purpose. He was willing to suffer and die for this purpose. And he was suffering. He was in prison. He was in chains, probably chained to a Roman guard in a house in, uh, under house arrest in Rome. And so Paul viewed his sufferings not like you and I might, you and I might go, oh, woe is me. I'm going through such a hard time. We, we would maybe say something like that, put a post on uh, social media talking about all the troubles and travails of life, but not Paul. Paul didn't view his sufferings that way. Paul basically said, my sufferings are being accomplished for you, for the church, for God's people. But I wonder why. Why would, why would Paul think of his sufferings this way? Because it's sort of an unusual way to think of it. Well, here's the picture, big picture, okay? When Jesus came, he ushered in the kingdom of God. And so the, the kingdom of God is present here in this world, but it is not yet fully consummated. It is not yet finally culminated. That will come when Jesus returns. Uh, but it is nevertheless, the kingdom of God is nevertheless here. It is present uh, for those who have faith in Christ. We experience the rule of God in our lives, the kingdom of God. And so in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God makes it clear that His people will endure suffering once the final days arrive. And you might be thinking, well, thank goodness those final days haven't arrived yet. Uh, but I have to tell you, you'd be wrong. The final days have arrived. In fact, when Peter in Acts chapter 2 preached his sermon after the Holy Spirit came upon the church that day, Peter made it very clear that the last days, the last days began on that day. We are currently and have been since Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, been in the last days. And during the last days, God makes it clear in both the Old and New Testament that His people will suffer. And what Paul is suggesting in this little phrase is that His sufferings, Paul's sufferings, are a part of the plan of God that God will use to bring about faith in the Messiah, the same Messiah whose return will culminate or finalize or realize to the whole world God's kingdom. And so by telling the church at Colossae that he rejoices in his sufferings for them, I think Paul may be saying this, that he is willing to put the bullseye of sufferings that God's people have to experience. He's willing to put the bullseye on his back so that God, the rest of God's people, including the people at the Church of Colossae of that day, might not experience the full wrath of those who hate Christ and stand against God's plan. Well, then Paul says something interesting and maybe a little bit confusing in the rest of this verse. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. And then he adds, And I am completing in my flesh... What is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church? Now this is strange because we know that Christ himself suffered on the cross for us, the church. 
So what in the world is Paul talking about? That he is completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. How could there be anything lacking in the afflictions or the sufferings of Christ? And I think it's a great question and one that deserves an answer. The answer is actually found when you look very carefully at this verse. And it's hard to tell in your English translation, but I'll go ahead and tell you this, that the word translated afflictions, when talking about Christ's afflictions, the word translated afflictions is a word that is never used in the New Testament to speak about the cross of Christ. And so the, that phrase, Christ's afflictions, they don't refer to the cross. There's nothing lacking with regard to Christ's afflictions on the cross. The term Christ's afflictions should not be understand, understood as referring to his suffering and dying on the cross. Instead, it should be understood this way. That when Jesus died on the cross, it was, in one sense, the supreme outworking of the sufferings that occur when the kingdom of God collides with the kingdom of darkness, of sin, of suffering, of sickness, and of death. When those two kingdoms collide, suffering will occur. And the cross is the supreme outworking of that. However, just because Jesus suffered on the cross, that does not mean that all of the suffering is finished. You and I still suffer, don't we? All throughout Christian history, God's people have suffered as they have been faithful to God. And so in the last days, which were ushered in by Christ, there will be sufferings experienced by God's people. And when we suffer, our great high priest, Christ himself, commiserates with our pain. He understands our suffering in our afflictions. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross was more than sufficient to pay for our sins and to reverse the curse of Adam. But it does not mean that we will never have to suffer ourselves. A few examples. Does the cross of Christ mean forgiveness for you? Of course it does. So what happens to you if you go out and do something dumb? and you disobey God, what happens? You still suffer the consequences of it, don't you? Right? But oh God, I thought I was forgiven. Oh, you are, God would say. But you're going to suffer the consequences of your poor decision-making. Another example. The cross of Christ provides healing for us, doesn't it? However, Every last one of us, even those with the most uh, st strong faith in the cross of Christ to provide healing, even they get sick and die, don't we? You see, the cross of Christ is more than sufficient to provide for our every needs, but it does not mean that you and I will never suffer. Why is that? Why do we continue to suffer if Jesus paid it all on the cross? We still suffer because there are two spiritual kingdoms at war. Jesus Christ brought to earth the kingdom of God, and it will defeat the kingdom of sin and sickness and death. The cross of Christ has settled the outcome. However, there are still some skirmishes going on, and the war is not completely over. There's a bunch of people still who have yet to hear the message that God's kingdom has come through Christ, and that is our task. Our task is to tell people about Christ, even if it means we suffer for it. And that's what Paul was experiencing to put it differently, what happened to Jesus on the cross has a ripple effect on us. 
We suffer as we tell people the mystery that has been revealed to us. Let me say that last part again. We suffer as we tell people the mystery that has been revealed to us. And you're wondering, okay, well, what is the mystery that we tell people? We'll get to that in just a second. But I want you to understand that the cross of Christ was like throwing a big rock into a pond. It creates a wake, and it has a ripple effect on us. And our job is to tell people the answer to the mystery that they don't even know about. In verses 25 and 26, Paul tells us a little bit more. He says, I have become the church's servant. I've become its servant. According to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, his holy ones, that's you and me. Paul is saying that his life's mission is to tell people about the mystery that God has finally revealed to us. So, what is the mystery? The mystery is God's plan that He came up with before the foundation of the world, yet He kept it hidden from the rulers of this world. Got that? The mystery is that God had a plan. He came up with it before He ever created the world. However, He kept the plan hidden from the rulers of this world. So, two questions arise from this. Number one, who were the rulers of the world and what is God's plan? Well, let's, let's answer those questions. Who are the rulers of the world? Are we talking about kings, prime ministers, presidents, Congress? Well, it's certainly true that Kings, even in ancient days, didn't know God's plan. But kings and prime ministers and presidents aren't the real rulers of this world. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Paul says to that church, On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory, None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Who are these rulers of this age, the rulers of this world, who never would have crucified Christ had they understood God's plan? These were not human kings Paul is referring to. These are spiritual beings that God had created and had given limited administrative rule over the nations. These lesser spiritual beings make up the divine assembly or the divine council that is addressed in Psalm 82. In Psalm 82, God passes judgment over his divine council. These spiritual beings that are given administrative rule over the nations. Now, why in the world did, if God created the bunch of spiritual beings and he gave them administrative rule over the nations, why is he judging them in Psalm 82? You know why he's judging them in Psalm 82? Because they did a bad job. That's why. And it wasn't just a mistake. They did a really bad job. According to Psalm 82, these lesser spiritual beings, these members of God's divine council, were supposed to, and I quote, they were supposed to provide justice for the needy and the fatherless, Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and needy and save, the, save them from the power of the wicked. But the divine counsel that God had created and given administrative rule over the nations did none of those things. And the people that are on earth that God loves suffered because of it. Even you and I today can look around our world and see that justice, human rights, and righteousness are in short supply. The members of the divine council have failed in their responsibility, 
and God has pronounced judgment against them. These are the lesser spiritual beings who are the rulers of this age, the rulers of this world. And these are the ones from whom God kept his plan hidden. God kept his plan a mystery. He kept it a secret that only he knew about. In Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, we read these words. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation about Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures, according to the command of the eternal God, here it is, to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. God kept his plan secret from the rulers of this world for a long time. Little fragments of it, little fragments, little pieces of God's plan were sprinkled here and there in the Old Testament. But they were never connected together. And that was by design. They were fragmented intentionally so that no one would figure out the mystery of God's plan until it was too late to do anything about it. None of the Old Testament prophets who actually wrote the Old Testament could figure out the mystery of God's plan. None of Jesus' disciples who could read the Old Testament could figure out the mystery of God's plan. Even the lesser spiritual beings who are members of God's divine counsel to rule over the world could not figure out the mystery of God's plan. So that brings up the other question. What was the plan that God kept secret for so long? It's right there on the screen. God's plan was to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. Before the foundation of the world, before God had created anything, God had a plan to have a family that would include all kinds of humans whom he would love and who would have faith in him and love him in return. And even though God had given limited administrative rule of the nations over to lesser spiritual beings, he kept one people, God kept one people all to himself. One people worshipped the Most High God. One people worshipped Yahweh while all the other nations of the world worshipped all the false gods they could think of, many of whom were no doubt reflections of the members of the divine council. And through ancient Israel, this one people that God kept all to himself, God would bring forth a Savior, not only of Israel, not only of the Jews, but also he would be the Savior of non-Jews. Gentiles, like most of us in this room. And in order to bring humans into his family, the Savior that God sent into the world, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, would, he would have to die on a cross. And the death of Jesus on the cross paid the penalty for the sins of the world. However, the Savior of the world would not remain dead. The Savior of the world could not be captured by the grave. He conquered death by rising from the grave. And now, whoever, Jew or Gentile, whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved and become a part of God's family. The mysterious plan of God that has now been revealed is this. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, all people, including Gentiles, can be 
in God's family. This is the mystery hidden from all people and all spiritual beings that has now been revealed through the cross. It is this, that we Gentiles no longer have to be ruled by lesser spiritual beings. Through Christ and Him alone, we have access to the Most High God. He is our God. Yahweh is our King. The God who rules the universe is our Father who has adopted us into His family. And so as the Apostle Paul proclaimed this mystery to the people, he suffered for it. Because these lesser spiritual beings do not give up their rule easily. He suffered for proclaiming the kingdom of God coming through Christ. And as you and I, as we proclaim this mystery to people, we suffer for it too. God has ordained us to suffer as His kingdom collides with the remnant of the kingdom of death and sin and sickness that came through Adam. The rulers of this present evil age who have great influence in Moscow, in Beijing, in Washington, D.C., and in Austin, work to p- keep people from understanding this mystery that they can become part of God's family. The rulers of this present evil age who have great influence in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, and the Texas Tribune do not want people to place their faith in Jesus Christ. The rulers of this present evil age who have great influence in Hollywood and Silicon Valley want people to be kept in the dark about salvation in Christ. And so as we reveal this mystery to people about how they can become a member of God's family by believing in Christ, we suffer. And that's okay. We will not let sufferings stop us. Paul continues in verse 27. He says, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When Paul says Christ in you, remember, he's writing to Gentiles. He's saying that the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ, is in you Gentiles. The Savior of the world has come to dwell in people that were not God's own. He's come to dwell in us. Do you see what God wants? God wants Gentiles to know that Christ has come to dwell in Gentiles. We can have hope for glory in the future. We Gentiles can have the assurance that we will be glorified in the future. That this body, this body that is given to aging and sickness and decay and death, this body one day will be glorified. It will be resurrected from the dead. And where does this assurance come from? It comes from Christ who is our Messiah, who is our Savior, who now dwells spiritually in us Gentiles if we believe in Him. In verse 28, Paul says, We proclaim Him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And so we are to proclaim Christ to people who do not yet know Him, and we are to proclaim Christ to those who do know Him. We want believers to become fully mature in Christ, completely like Christ. And you might be thinking, well, how in the world can I ever become completely like Christ? I'm, I'm nothing like Christ. I'm full of sin. I'm full of, I'm full of nonsense. You know, I'm full of bad decisions. I can't become completely like Christ. How is this possible? This is only possible once we have died and been resurrected 
and glorified. We can become conformed, and we will become conformed to Christ's image completely by means of our resurrection from the dead. When we're resurrected from the dead, our bodies will be glorified. What does that mean for you and me? It means you're going to have a body that's no longer subject to disease. Won't that be nice? You're going to have a body that's no longer subject to decay. You're going to have a body that never dies again. We'll no longer have to suffer sin. We'll no longer have to suffer afflictions. We'll no longer have sorrows. This is not something that can be accomplished by you, but it will be done for you when Christ returns and we are raised from the dead. However, what you can do in this life is you can grow more conformed to Christ. You can grow more spiritually. How? By yielding yourself to the Spirit of God. And He will make you more like the very Son of God. How does this happen? How can I become like Christ today? That should be your question every day. How can I be more like Christ today? How can I be more like Christ in this situation? And Paul writes in this verse that he's warning people. Some translations use the word admonishing people. This word means that he's trying to get bad thinking straightened out. That sometimes we become muddled in the way we think. And when Christians get muddled in the way we think, when Christians sort of start listening to too many voices, instead of the voice of God, instead of reading our scriptures and, and understanding what God expects of us, and we start listening to everything else under the sun and everyone else under the sun, we start going after this and going after that. And sometimes we, we think that true wisdom and true knowledge, well, maybe it's found on the radio. Or, or maybe it's found on TV. Or maybe it's found on social media. Or maybe it's found down at the lodge. Or maybe it's found down at the pub. Or maybe it's found in Washington, D.C. And I would tell you, if anyone that thinks the wisdom is found in Washington, D.C., their minds are muddled. You're not going to find wisdom there. Not God's wisdom. If you want wisdom, open your Bible and read it. If you want wisdom, come to church, a Bible-teaching church, and hear it. The Bible is the Word of God. All Scripture is breathed out by God Himself and is profitable for teaching, for reproof. That means it'll tell you when you did something wrong. For correction, that means it'll tell you how not to do it again. And for training in righteousness, that means it will tell you how to live your life right. That's what Scripture is good for. You won't find all of that anywhere else. Paul says in verse 29, I labor for the striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. The word striving means he's, he's acting like an athlete, an athlete that is giving his whole life to win the Olympics, to give his whole life to win that championship. And so he's, he trains and the one, the one who practices the hardest usually is the one who wins, right? So he's training, and he's practicing, and he's working, he's striving. He's saying that he wants to do everything he can to tell as many people as he can that they can be a part of God's family. When you and I get about the business of telling people that Christ has accomplished their salvation, and that they can become part of God's family. And they don't have to be good enough for God. They don't have to get their act right, get their life right, and then God will accept them. No, no, no. Christ has done it all. His righteousness has accomplished it all. All we have to do is have faith in Christ. Have faith in Christ. And when you and I get serious about telling people that message and revealing this mystery to them, then Christ gives us His strength to accomplish that. 
Look what Paul said. He says, I'm striving with his strength. You'll have supernatural strength from on high when you join God in mission. And the mission is tell people about the mystery, the greatest mystery of all time. How can I come to God? That's the greatest mystery of all time. The mystery has been solved. The mystery has been revealed. You come to God through Christ. When you are in Christ, you have access to the Father. And only through Him can you have access to the Father. How can I be in the Lord Jesus Christ? How can I come to Christ? You have to understand and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord over all. That means he's the boss. He's in charge. He's the highest authority. That's what Lord means. And so he's the highest authority in your life. In fact, he's the highest authority there is. Jesus Christ is Lord over all. You have to understand what he did for you. He died on the cross for your sins. He was raised to dead to give you eternal life. And then all you have to do is trust in him, believe in him. Confess him as Lord, and you will be part of God's family. Are you ready to change teams? Are you ready to come to the Father? Worship him and him alone through Christ. That is the conversion that we're talking about. It means you no longer live for yourself. You no longer live for some other false god that you either consciously recognize or not. But now you consciously recognize that the Lord, the Most High God, is your God and you are to worship Him and come to Him through Christ. If you're ready to do that, He'll receive you today.